just wanted to uh, take a moment before we go into our, our uh, message on uh, the characteristics of a relationship. I just want to do a, a quick interview uh, before we uh, do that with Rob and Wendy. And so, uh, Rob and Wendy, if you would unmute yourself. No, nope, I did got it. it. I did it. Oh, yeah, you're, you guys are there. I couldn't see your lovely faces, so I was wondering, where did you go? Anyways, uh, you know, as I speak on relationship, uh, religion versus relationship, I thought, well, it'd be good to actually hear about a relationship, which I admire in a marriage uh, between Rob and Wendy. And, and so I just wanted to just do a, three quick uh, interview questions. And the first one was, you guys, who initiated your relationship? And... Uh, what drew you to each other? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess it was me. I, I originally initiated it, um, mostly just because she was pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, bottom line, yeah, she was just an attractive woman that worked in the store I worked at, and and I, uh, yeah. And I think for me, How about you, Wendy. Well, what attracted me to Rob was his uh, his genuine. He was so genuine and he was gentle and always up and happy. And I watched him from where I worked in the store. I could see the whole store basically. And he always interacted with everyone and he was always so quick to help people. And, and uh, yeah, he was just, I don't know. He's a great guy. He was very friendly and uh, uh, came to me and said, Hey, you want to have coffee on a coffee break? And I just thought, you know, I was new to Penticton. I'd only been there about a month and a half. Edmonton. Or I mean, uh, Edmonton. Edmonton. And um, yeah, so his personality really spoke out to me. Okay, thank you. Uh, Blake, I think there's a little bit of issue with uh, my mic or my voice. I've been told I sound like Mickey Mouse right now. So uh, if you could yeah, just you do. that. <laughs> just... <laughs> there we go. The second question I, I had for uh, Rob Wendy was, you know, every relationship starts off with this great, uh, oh, they're so lovely, and then it, and then life hits. Uh, so, what are some of the challenges that you faced in your relationship over the years? Some of the challenges, well, we've all had financial problems, you know, through the years. Everybody, I'm sure. Um, I think uh, for us right out of the gate, one of our challenges was that I had children and Rob didn't have children. So I became a, I was a packaged deal, if I could say. And yeah. so for him, uh, not that I wouldn't really say that it was a challenge, but he had to, it wasn't just me. It was me and two children. And so the way that he interacted <clears throat> and how well he received them. And as you all, I mean, for those of you who know us, he raised those kids like they were his own. So right out of the gate, we had that challenge of a blended uh, person. <laughs> and if I may, in that, uh, I remember growing up uh, as a young adult saying, I never wanted kids. I wanted to be that single family guy, like or single guy with no family. I was okay with that. And then, I met Wendy. <laughs> then I met Wendy. Prior to Wendy, I had never gone out with and been committed to anybody longer than probably three months, ever, until I met Wendy. Yeah, I won the prize. And she was a package deal. And so that was captured, cap captured each other's heart. And yeah, we really did. And, yeah. uh, you know, and then we got married a year and a half later. And then, you know, five years after that, we came to know Jesus. And, you know, like Rob had mentioned, everyone has challenges, financial, um, you know, There's, living, just yeah. life. Jobs um, change and come and go. Yeah. But we went through that together. And I think that was yeah. really cool because we never, <clears throat> we never judged it. Like we just went through it together. And that was even before we knew Jesus. And, you know, our number one thing also when we first got married was communication hands down communication was the number one thing in our marriage it nothing else mattered if we didn't learn how to communicate so we actually learned how to do that and to communicate with our kids and, and, and we, uh, we, we talked yeah. through everything yeah we invested in each other right away and i i don't think 
we've ever gone to bed mad at one another. No. We've always made sure that we've talked everything, whatever we're going through together, talked it through. And we've given awesome. each other, we've yeah. also given each other the opportunity to voice our opinions, which is really cool. Perfect. So you've, you've communicated and you've voiced your opinions. So that's how you've overcome a lot of the challenges you may face. So yeah. where, where would you say your relationship's at today compared to when you first were together? Oh, wow. Well, well <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I, I, I love Wendy more today than I did yesterday and, and the 10 years before that and the 20 years before that. And why do you think that is, Rob? Because she gets, she understands us. She understands me more. And she has, and I've grown with her. And she's uh, always been there for me. That's good. Wendy, yourself. I think for where we are now is um, the fact that we have Jesus in our life too. And with, uh, with the Jesus being a part of our life, we've learned to be, content with where we're at so you know 10 years ago we were content with where we at you know we look at our friends and what they had and oh we don't have it and but we were content and we now we know like undoubtedly god says i'm with you always and it doesn't matter what we go through uh right now we totally rely on him a hundred percent and yeah, we make mistakes. Oh man, boy, do we make mistakes. <laughs> but uh, we don't ever give up on each other. We don't give up on God and where he, the direction that he's taking us in and, and just staying in that place of trying really hard to be humble and to be um, always wanting to learn, God, what's in this for us? And then we, we just, you know, we bounce off of each other, you know, yeah, and we never sharpen each other, I guess you could say. We never make a decision without talking with the other, with, with, with each other prior. You know, we get a lot of people, some people say, oh, you guys are so codependent. And I absolutely disagree with that because I love spending time with Rob. Like we used to work together. We, we fish together. We read together. We yeah. hang out together. And so we make decisions together and, if I don't know what the plan is, we, I talk with Rob, what's the plan? Can we do this? Should we do this? So um, we're just, I don't know, we're just two crazy people that are still madly in love with each other and love to spend time with each other. Yeah. And the people that hang around with us, they can t say it, you know, well, I just love your relationship. It's like, you know what? That's God. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you too for sharing a little bit about your story and where you've been through and where you've come to. I appreciate it very much. And, and uh, yeah, I keep going. One thing I'll say about Rob and Wendy is, is every time they meet one another, they give each other a kiss and <laughs> they are always hanging out with one another and always communicating. So that is a truth. So bless you guys and continue to be that strong example of a good relationship. Thank, Thank you. you. You bet. You know, I, I, I wanted to do a little bit of an interview on the, uh, on a relationship. Because, you know, relationships, when you think about them, are a lot e harder work than religion. And uh, religion sets you a, a standard of formats and that you follow and you know your rules. Uh, there's really nothing to know one another. There's no development. You just have to perform harder to fulfill the, the, the needs of a religious movement. Whereas a relationship is, is always moving. It's always about gathering and knowing and, and going through obstacles together and, and strengthening each other and sometimes challenging each other. Uh, and bottom line is a relationship is hard work. And so this morning, as I wanted to uh, speak on uh, religion versus relationship, as I mentioned earlier, it's the characteristics of a relationship that we're gonna talk about. And we're gonna read through Second Peter uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 1 to 4, but we're going to do that in a second, and I'm just going to share a little bit of my, my relationship. Uh, in 1991, uh, Tara Lee Grant uh, began working at Mountain View Funeral Home in Calgary. Tara Lee soon caught the attention of all the young funeral directors because of her stunning beauty. In fact, my roommate at the time thought she was amazing and decided that he would take her out on a date. And so he asked her, 
Uh, he was kind of that good looking, outgoing Casanova type personality, liked to dress like a GQ man. He was a good guy. And so they went out on a date. Myself, I'm more of a reserved, hide in the wing, wings, uh, behind the bush kind of guy. And so I waited in the background for a more private opportunity to uh, take Terry Lee out on a date. So eventually my roommate left for Australia with his off again, on again girlfriend. And so I decided to woo Tara Lee with my charm. So I brought McDonald's to her workplace, Mountain View Funeral Home, while delivering one of my clients that I had worked on. Yeah, that's a little bit of a funeral home thing, but that's what I did. Quite a romantic, and aren't I? I proceeded to work up the courage to go and ask Tara Lee on a date. And so after the McDonald's and, and spending that uh, lunch hour with her, our first date was a playing billiards, uh, which she won, or should I say I let her win? Uh, no, she beat me in a game of pool, uh, eight ball. She was pretty good. She would try to tell you that she won in basketball too, but I think I won uh, there because I just let her win. I'm a romantic. Anyways, the rest is history. 27 years of adventure, roller coaster of relational trials. We have two children later and a granddaughter, and we're still standing. We, we sing a song or, uh, uh, by Shania Twain, we're still there. I can't, I can't remember the actual words. Terry Lee would have to remember the words to that. But it's when all obstacles came against us, we are still standing. We were actually in our marriage council told that we would only last six months because of the difference. And I got to say, it's been quite a ride, but we're still here. You know, that's relationship. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a time when in John chapter six, it's not in our notes here, when Jesus was inter interacting with the religious people and the people of his society at the time he was walking, and he said some hard truths. And they all bailed on him. They ran away. And he looked at his close core group of people that were around him. And he says, are you also going to leave? And Peter, of course, which is one of my foundational verses, says, where would we go, Lord? You're the only one that has the words to eternal life. And that's kind of what it means to be in living relationship, not only with each other, but also with God. It's a challenge to grow in relationship, especially when obstacles and things come against us. So today we're going to continue looking into religion versus relationship. As the slide says, religion and culture are usually go hand in hand, which is and family and stuff. And sometimes we have to follow a mandate of culture or family and deny who we are as God's people, gifted as God's people or persons. And that's not re relationship, that's religion. Relationship allows us to develop naturally uh, in the area of, of knowing each other and knowing God. And so the first uh, characteristic of a relationship, as we read through the scriptures, is 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 4, or 2 Peter, sorry. This letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of this glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. You know, last week, I did a preamble to religion versus relationship and ended with Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and act to it in order to fulfill his good purpose. 
You know, this is an amazing, this is the amazing grace of God and a picture of what a true relationship looks like. As we work through questions, doubts, and trials of faith, not only with God, but with each other, God meticulously transforms us instead of condemning us uh, like religion would do, which leaves no room for asking questions and doubts. The scripture is a great measuring stick for determining the difference between whether we're in a religion or a relationship with God and with each other. The first characteristic of a relationship is it is a gift. Relationship starts as a gift. It's not a demand. It's a gift of knowing another person. All spiritual relationships are initiated by God. It's, we see this uh, in G God sending Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 1, it says this, Faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. Like any relationship, it starts with an individual pursuing another. And who gives the, who gives the pursued a choice of responding or rejecting to this pursuit. Religion demand does not always, does not allow the choice of, to the pursuit, but demands performance, acceptance, and locking down people into a, prison, a toxic prison of codependency and unhealthy control. Unconditional love is not available in religion, only conditional love. This is why many marriages, work environments, churches, and family breakdowns happen with a toxic culture of smothering control, me-only mindsets, and personal kingdom building, which disposes anything or anyone deemed non-essential. Religion tries to conform you into a set of rules, despite or regardless of who you are, it makes you try to perform to this, this, this rule book, and relationship on the other side allows the openness of transformation. You know, it's like euthanasia and abortion religion is, where the innocent are disposed because of cost or inconvenience. I know that's political, but the truth is both of them are done because of inconvenience or perceived worthlessness of a person. God, on the other hand, is not a dictator. He sees all of us as valued. He sees the whole world as valued. Uh, he is a lover who initiated the gift of relationship. You know, as you read all through the scriptures, through Genesis to Revelation, the theme is one of God pursuing humanity. And John 3.16 iterates that where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Relationship is a gift of God. Secondly, relationship is a pursuit, as I've mentioned earlier. Uh, verse 2 says, May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Second Peter 1. Uh, like marriage, the minute we take our foot off the gas pedal of knowing each other, just as Rob and when we were talking, as they continue to grow and communicate with other, each other, the minute you take your foot off that gas pedal, your marriage begins to die. That's why marriage is so difficult, because we get so familiar and so common with each other that we start to take each other for granted. And then when uh, offense or wrong things are said, we begin to attack one another because we've moved into a me first attitude. You know, it does not matter whether it's a man or a woman, we want to be no one. It does not mean that our relationships around us, both with God and man, will not uh, bring challenges and will not have challenges to deal with, but it is the pursuit of knowing each other which enhances our relationship to one of love and overcoming. When we feel common, we get insecure, we're offended, and we look over the fence at those things around us and we start comparing, but pursuit of relationship will overcome offense, poor habits, poor character, and it will slowly chisel and refine us to serve just because. Verse 1 states, God's pursued relationship, when he said, the faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. 
Verse 2 reveals the result of this pursuit of God by stating God's power and grace uh, rewards everyone as we pursue the knowledge of him uh, with gaining greater understanding. It says, may God give you what? More and more grace and peace as you know in your, as you grow in your knowledge. By growing in the knowledge of him, it will overflow into every other relationship, uh, not only with God, but with, with each other. Whether it's your spouse, your children, your siblings, your co-workers, your pastor, yeah, your pastor, uh, your church, your enemies, your family, and people that you work with or people around you, whether you know them closely or not. A good barometer of whether we're living in religion versus relationship is your attitudes. Are your old habits beginning to come back and take root? Ones that you once overcame are all of a sudden starting to rear their heads up again. Are we becoming toxic in our thinking and in our words? Are we becoming controlling and negative? Uh, you may have quit pursuing your relationship and become religious. If you're tired, if you're tired of people uh, or service or life in general and your relationship with God, maybe you have quit the pursuit of knowing God and his son, Jesus Christ. Remember, he says that grace and peace will abound to you as you grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ and God. Uh, third part of a relationship is uh, relationships and power. It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Where religion holds back, controls and demands, relationship and powers, transformation. transformation. A healthy relational person is infectious causing those around them to climb higher in goals, to fly above negativity, to live on purpose and pursue dreams. Religion takes away, it holds back, it isolates, criticizes, bullies, and brings poor self-esteem and is, in, is toxic to everyone around them. Uh, Hebrews 12 gives you a picture of a religious mindset. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God, Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. You know, the one translation that says defiles many. That's what happens when you get into a negative religious mindset. We begin to defile those around us. Negative speech about others or self and mauling around old hurts or playing negative tapes of the past back in your head or speaking them to yourself stifles the empowerment of God leading and leads us into unbelief. God is a God of, of love, and he is not going to be a dictator that demands you to conform, but he wants you to respond out of love so that he can transform you. Overcoming by practice, you must overcome by practicing the art of speech to overcome religion, uh, of speaking God's word over your life and on others as David did in Psalms 103. He says, let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. Remember what God says. You know, as you go through that rest of that thing, he'll talk about he heals all my diseases. He forgives all my uh, uh, sins and he continues on all the good things that God has done for him. Do you do that? Do you practice the art of, of telling yourself what God has done for you? The second one is who you are in Christ. Psalms 139 says, how precious are your thoughts about me, O God? They cannot be numbered. And then John chapter one says, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to be children of God. In Romans chapter 8, it says, And since we are his children, we are what? His heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are share in his glory, we must also share in his sufferings. 
And then verse 35, it says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it, does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or are hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? And then verse 37 says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And then Galatians chapter 4, I finish with this one, uh, says, now you are no longer what's a slave, but God's own child. And, he's, and since you are his children, God has made you an heir. You know, this is a big deal for those that are around uh, the Christian worldview. Uh, so many times we promote religion in the name of grace. We tell people to perform. We call them sinners saved by grace. We call them all these different thoughts. But in these passages of scripture, it says that we are overcomers and that we are heirs with God, not because of anything good that we've done, but because we've entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we become God's children. You know, there's a word that says we're all God's children, but that's not the truth of scripture. We are all creations of God, but we don't ever enter into that intimate relationship as God's children until we reach John chapter 1 verse 12 when we receive Jesus Christ, and he makes us and gives us the power to be children of God. You know, there's enough negative controlling thoughts in the world. Be that difference maker. God sent his son to empower relationship, not condemn. So let our relationships model to the world one of empowerment, not negativity. The final characteristic that I want to talk about in relationship is relationship protects. Uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, And because of this, of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share in his divine uh, nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. You know, healthy relationships like uh, protect. Our, like our, pro, our Victory Church uh, mo slogan says, No perfect people. Uh, this means that we live, we must live this slogan out, just not quote it, and have mercy by protecting when people stumble. This doesn't mean that we won't stumble, but we must protect each other when we do stumble. You know, I know Tara Lee, a lot of times in our relationship as, you know, and I'm growing in this area, but needs to feel that protection. Sometimes I haven't been protected. You know, my words can be cutting, they can be sarcastic, and that takes away that protective element that a true relationship needs to have. And so there's lots of times where I have to repent of that and have to bring myself into center and, and try to continue to protect relationship. And that doesn't matter whether it's with your spouse, your coworkers, your church family, or anyone in society. Are our words protective or condemning? This does not mean we do not hold each other uh, uh, accountable uh, to those who confess to be believers to a higher standard, but it does mean that we actually promote and empower growth in the other person. Galatians chapter 6 puts it like this, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by a, some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help or enable that person back on the right path. Not condemn them, not beat them up, not ostracize them, but to enable them to get back into fellowship. Uh, and be careful not to fall into the same temptation of yourself uh, as yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. <laughs> it's quite a sobering scripture uh, by the, the writer, letter of Galatians, uh, Paul. Uh, but the truth of the matter is we are called to protect each other. We're called to build up each other, to encourage other, each other, to stir up one another into good works and love, especially as God's day winds down before his coming. Uh, you know, that's found in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 25 to 26. And it's not in your notes, but read that out. It says, as the day of the Lord draws near, we should be gathering more closely to one another. We should be stirring up each other. We need a protecting, empowering relationship to overcome the negativity of the world that we live in. Like many others, I fall short. 
but this can never be used as an excuse uh, with the words, uh, I am only human for not protecting a relationship. We are God's children. Remember what the verse said uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1. It says, by his divine power, it initiated with God. God has done what? He's given us everything we need to live a godly life. We have no excuses if we're followers of Christ. It doesn't mean we won't stumble, but it means we live in a place of repentance and rest, which is our salvation. And repentance just means when we fail, we don't make excuses for our failure. We humbly go to the person that we've offended and we ask for forgiveness. Or we go to those people that are, we perceive that are offended and we say, have I done anything to hurt you? And if I have, I'm sorry. Regardless if we think we've done nothing wrong, we are reconcilers. We are protectors of the value of relationship. Look around the broken world around us. Uh, maybe uh, with the church rioting, criticism, criticizing, and, and in lots of people living in despair. But the example of protecting relationships in, is the church's job, and we should be a light in the midst of the chaos that's around us, not at adding to it. I remember one time I was in a, one of my funeral home courses uh, down in Hawaii, and a psychologist lady, she says, the funeral director's job is to promote healing not to add into an already negative experience and the church is the same way we are to promote healing and not add on to the worthlessness and the feelings of worthless of people and the toxic environment that we live in we are the light of the world to bring value to relationship religion always focuses on negativity but protecting relationships focuses on accountability leading to transformation God had everything right, had every right to destroy humanity because we rejected him, not the other way around. But what did he do? Instead, he chose to redeem us, to protect us, and offer us relationship. Just as John 3, 6, uh, 3, 17 says, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Victory Church of Penticton's fourth culture statement is, we make each other look good. Our call as individuals and as a group to, uh, to live, is to live in protecting relationships. Ephesians uh, chapter 4 verse 2 says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourself together with the peace. Uh, you know, the reality is, is God has given us his divine nature that we may live godly life. He's equipped us and given us, given us everything by faith. It's his job to give us the supplied needs. It's our job to make the effort to keep those uh, unity of the spirit. It's not God's job to bring peace and unity. He's given us what we need. It's our job to live in peace and unity by overcoming our own selfish desires and negative talk. How are you doing in your relationship? These are questions to reflect on at the end of our message. How are you doing in your relationship, whether it's a marriage, your home, your church family? The second question, are you offering the gift of relationship as God did for us? You know, are you looking at the marginalized, the people that are your enemies, the people that look unredeemable? Are you offering them the gift of relationship just by be, just being a friend? You know, we, you know, many people say, well, how do I share my faith? Well, the first thing is you say hello. <laughs> it's pretty standard. Hello, how are you? My name is so-and-so. And you offer that beginning gift of relationship. They can reject it. Remember I said at the beginning, relationship has the ability to say no to the pursuit. But if you just basically come and ask people uh, what their name is, you are the one that initiates the relationship as God's people. The, the, third, or the third question, as it's up on the screen, are you pursuing God and others in that relationship? So you said hello. That's great. You started it. But now are you pursuing people in relationship? And are you pursuing God? You know, I've been serving the Lord since 1995. And you know, there's times and periods in my, my Christian walk where it gets dry and stale and it's hard. 
and I look back many times, it's because I've started to take my relationship with God for granted. You remember he said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, he says, he abounds grace and peace to those who grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Are you growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Because if you're not, you're going backwards. And just as Rob and Wendy mentioned that their relationship now is stronger than before, are you growing in the knowledge of each other? Knowing what makes you mad, what doesn't make you mad, what blesses a person around you, what doesn't bless a person. Those are all growing and pursuing the knowledge of each other. The third question, do you empower a relationship with hope and enthusiasm? Are you one of those Eeyores off Winnie the Pooh where everything is negative, everything is poor me? Or are you like Tigger who bounces around and, and basically brings enthusiasm and excitement to the, the whole crowd around them? You may not be the most outgoing person, but you can still empower a relationship by a sense of hope. Remember, the message of the gospel means good news. It means that we are new, good news bringers, and we are also people that bring goodness to relationship and enthusiasm to relationship, not bring people down. The, the next question is, do you protect and value relationships? You know, when we re live relationship as God intended, uh, Proverbs 16 states, when people live at peace with the Lord, even their enemies are at peace with them. You know, you may have antagonistic people in your life. It may be a spouse, it may be a child, it may be a coworker, it may be a former family member, it may be a family member, but are you adding fuel to the fire? of that relationship, the offense, the negativity, and maybe a church that's offended you? Are you adding fuel with negative talk and criticizing and judgmental? You may be justified, but I can tell you, you reap what you sow. And so if you're injecting negativity, condemnation, and, and judgment, it says in Luke chapter 6, 38, it says that you will reap that amount back to you pressed down and poured into your lap. Read it for yourself, Luke 6, 38. So if you're experiencing some of the negative things in your life, you have to look at what you're offering in response. This scripture tells us when we're in right relationship with God, in other words, we're not mad at God, but we're seeking God. Doesn't mean we don't question him and cry out to him and ask him what he's doing. But we at the end say, okay, God, you're God and I'm not, and I will trust you. It says then even our enemies will be at peace with us. If we invest in knowing God and his son, he, we will experience peace and grace in abundance. Have mercy on those who offend us and seek the lost and the marginalized not because we have to out of religious duty, but because we so, like God, we love the world and we love one another that we want to see him reconciled to our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. A church living like this will never lack for people, resources, or joy. Remember these words, you reap what you sow. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just thank you that you are a God of abundance. Uh, you poured out your spirit upon all flesh that they can know you. And then for us as your people, you poured out that spirit that we can be witnesses, Lord, that we can love and, and suffer with joy, knowing that you will work all things out for the good of those that love you and are called according to your purpose, knowing that you work in us to will and act according to your purposes, and that you will carry that work to completion of all that say, hey, Lord, come and be my, the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.